we thank God for being here. I'm excited because of what God is doing in our midst. I am here this morning just to share God's word. Um, you know, when, when uh, we didn't know this was going to, to be, when, and, and I, I actually don't know whether you knew that this was going to be when you're growing up as a young boy or as a young girl, and you are thinking about how um, this uh, life would turn out, and that you loved God the way you knew, and that you were sold out to serve God. None of us knew it was going to be like this. But thank God that we are here. By the way, happy Father's Day for all the fathers in the house. Ah, wa baba, wale mko kwa nyumba. Tusimame. We have rare opportunities. Ah, let's make noise about this thing. Now, these fathers. Yes, fathers. And if there is a father standing next to you, please give them a high five. Give them a high five. Fathers, wonderful, wonderful people. Yes, were it not for the fathers, we wouldn't have been here, isn't it? Yes, so we honor you, fathers. You're important people. Yes, thank you. Thank you, fathers. And you're looking good from this point. Ah, wonderful man. Fathers. Father is destiny, you know. Unajua hatuna siku mingi. Kuna kuanga na Mother's Day, Women's Day, Ladies' Day. For men, it is just Father's Day. So we can... Yes, fathers. Um, yes, even would be fathers. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we want to share God's word in uh, the next couple of minutes. And I want to be talking about God. And thank God that um, today is Father's Day. I want to talk about God our Father, but we'll not be talking about God in terms of Him being our Father. We'll be talking about God as who God is. In other words, we are asking ourselves, do we know who God is? And I'm sure you know who God is. We have, we have, we have some knowledge of who God is, and we have um, some understanding of who God is. But we'll just be asking ourselves, who is God? Who is God? If somebody asked you, who is God, what would you say? Say, this is the person who has saved me. He is the creator of the universe. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is mighty redeemer. <laughs> you know, all those things. But when we're asking ourselves who God is, we want to understand. We want to know. We want to experience what God has done for us. Because indeed he has done something. And so in trying to get into our sharing, scripture says in the book of John chapter number 4 and verse number 24, so that we attempt to understand who God is, because I am not sure we can fully comprehend who God is, and that makes him God. Uh, scripture says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, if we're going to worship God, then we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. But it says, God is spirit. And so the question we ask then, how do I understand this spirit? How do you understand this spirit? It is not possible for you to relate it's not possible for you to understand who God is if you do not enter into that realm of the spirit and get to decode what God is doing and what God is saying. And therefore, we are saying it is very difficult for us to understand and to know as human beings who God is in our natural setting. We can only understand God if we allow God to help us to understand him. And that makes him God. So we ask ourselves, then if that is who God is, then who created God? And, and even before we get into this, um, I, I, I thought to myself, and uh, these are things that I like imagining when, when I read scriptures. What God has done in this entire universe, because he is the boss, you know? <laughs> you, you know when you talk to the boss and the boss is in charge, he's not moved. He's not moved by what you say, by what, you know, the boss remains a boss, isn't it? God is a boss. To the people who do not, or say they do not um, subscribe to him, and to the people who worship him as God, he remains God. He's not moved about those that keep saying there is no God. And so I, I, I was seated, I was asking myself, had I been God for a moment, and I know this is something I have thought over and over, <laughs> or if you are God for a week, what would you do? What kind of a God would you be? What would happen into this country? 
What would you want to see changed? And you know, that thinking helped me to go into looking at what other people think or they would do if they were given to be God. And one of the people that, <laughs> that I saw um, said, I'll just appear and then resign. <laughs> Can you imagine God resigning and then leaving us to the confusion that will be there? You know, another one says um, they, would, they would deal with sickness and disease, eliminate sickness and disease, and even death, that there will be no death. And somebody else also said that if he were given to be God for a moment, he would make sure that death would be friendly. That when you're dying, you enjoy dying. <laughs> Wonderful ideas, isn't it? But I also got to listen to an atheist or look out. And when I got to what they said, imagine what they said. I didn't read it. Right there and then, because he had given a comment on being God, yet they tell us. <laughs> so I didn't read it. I didn't want to know. I got to understand that, yes, even the atheists know that there is God. Now, you don't want to know what I would do if I was God. If you want, we can share some moments uh, after we are done with the service. So, who created God? Scripture tells us in Psalm chapter number 90, verse number 1 to 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. It says in verse number 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth, the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So that simply tells us that God was not created. God was there before. God existed out of time. We as human beings would have a problem with that um, scripture or understanding that God was not created because we are limited. We want to know when something begins and where it ends so that we know where we are coming in, a point of entry into whatever matter it is. So the Lord, the God that we are talking about, the God that we, we, we serve, the God that we believe in, this one, our God, the one who died on the cross for you and me, he was not created. He has existed before time. Before even the scientists would come and tell us that there was, there was some force that, before they came and discovered that force, because that force was created by God, God was there. And so God is not a creation. God is a creator. He is the one who has created. And so we can look to him as the self-existent God the creator of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, that which we see and that which we do not see. When we went to school many years ago, the teachers told us that this, this, this uh, space we see here has so many gases. I choose to believe them. I don't know, but there are several gases. We cannot see them. It is God who created them. <laughs> and so that is the God that we're talking about. He has created the entire universe that we live in. And, and the one that we, we, we pride in. And the one that causes a lot of us to fight. Like I know there are people who are busy fighting over territories. Those territories were created by God. You know, the war between the, the, the Russians and uh, the, the Ukrainians. They're fighting because you have invaded our land. And you know, that greed of wanting to get what is somebody else, that was created by God. And God has existed even before those those people who are fighting, even before the grabbers, the land grabbers who are in this country, who grab land, 
and then sell to, to us. That land, the title deed, the mother title, <laughs> mother title, it reads Jehovah God. <laughs> that is a God that we serve. His name is Jehovah, meaning self-existent or eternal. Eternal means he has no end. He, has, he is from eternity, beginning, if there is something like that. And he will be there, eternity, future. Eternity, past, and continuing, and eternity, future. That is when there will be no end, he will still be there. When there was no beginning, God was there. And so he is the self-existent or eternal God. His name Jehovah is, is his, his name. Is his, he, it can only be given to him because he is the creator. Nobody else can be Jehovah. Even if they call themselves Jehovah Anyoni and Jehovah whoever. They cannot be that Jehovah who is the creator. You know we have so many Jehovahs including Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and, and we have somebody, we, we had a Jesus someplace. And he was arrested. Our Jesus cannot be arrested. Even when he was taken to the cross, he willed to do that for you and me. Now, those Jehovah's who are arrested are idols. They are gods, small g. Our Jehovah is capital G. He's the OG. <laughs> he cannot be arrested. He is in control of your life, of my life, of the universe. Again, they told us when we went to school that this, this universe is, is held by something. That the, the, the world that we live in, the earth that we live in, revolves around its... Is it, is it axis? Is it the sun or the earth? One of those. Oh, the, the sun does not revolve. It is the earth. It revolves on its own axis. And as it revolves, it maintains a distance from the sun that is accommodated for all of us. If for a moment, this earth would just tilt a bit towards the sun, we just evaporate. We, all of us we just we roast. Roasting is good because it takes time. You can see roasting. We just vanish. And he allows that earth to continue rotating on its own axis before you are born. Now that you are here and after you are gone. Now that is our God. Scripture says in the book of Acts chapter number 17 from verse 24 to 28 if you'd give us that it says god who made the world and everything in it since he is lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life breath and all things it says in verse 26 and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. And verse number 28 says for in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring. Now, that God has decided to dwell in you and in me. The creator of the universe, the one who is eternal, the one who does great and mighty things, that God has decided that being so big, he will dwell in this vessel, in these mortal bodies. Being in charge of the entire world, that he will also dwell in in you. Now that is huge. And that is a gift of God. And we, we, we might not have enough words to tell about this God. But we see 
in a moment or in, in some way the character of God and so we understand that God is actually working in us, through us and for us. We might not understand and some of us even, even getting to think about the world itself we, we get to the end of our thinking. Is it the world? Is it the earth? So which one is bigger? Is it the universe? I do not care. What I care is that that God who is in charge of the universe, of the world, of the earth, lives in me. He's in control. And he has decided and he desires to continue living in you. And so we look at the character of God and in, in a way, just trying to understand, then what is this that God has done? And one of the things that we learn about God is that God is trustworthy. God can be trusted. Now, the meaning of trust could also be having confidence in. So that when somebody says, I trust you, it simply says, in other words, they have confidence in you. They know that they can take your word. They can, they can believe what you have told them and that you're not going to change tomorrow. Now, God is trustworthy, brothers and sisters, through and through, to the very end. He is not going to change. He has not changed. He remains the same. And so if he has promised, he shall deliver. He, he can be trusted. You know, when you talk about trusting, a lot of things come into my mind. I don't know how many of us growing up, and it was a good thing, we trusted our parents. And I keep remembering things that <laughs> happened to me. I trusted my dad, but at some point he let me down. Not because he wanted, but because he was man. All the fathers in the house, we have celebrated you today. I know we have made promises to our children. And you are good fathers, and also mothers included. But we promise some things, but we don't deliver. Why? Because we are mortal human beings. We are limited. Sometimes we, we get to the place of asking ourselves, why did I even promise? Ah, how about the people who love each other? I love you, Esther. I cannot sleep. I cannot. Especially when people are young. I, I don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. How? You know. And because you're a human being, we cannot trust you fully. Because we have seen the results. We have seen, we have records. You trusted somebody, they let you down. They left you in a place where you are helpless. And those are the people that we say, at some point, we trusted them. Scripture says in Isaiah 26 and verse number 4, Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. He is an eternal rock. You can trust. You can trust the Lord. The builders, I am told, who, who do building or construction, they will not build a foundation until they get to the place where they know now this foundation can be trusted to hold a building. And so some of them will dig until they get to the rock. They will dig until they get to that place where it is hard enough. Now, eternal rock is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is our God. And he will hold the building. The building will have integrity because it is founded on that rock who is Jesus Christ. Lamentations chapter number 3 verse 22 to 23 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. Or great is your faithfulness. Brothers and sisters, if we get to know who God is, we do not need to be afraid that tomorrow he will change his mind. If we understand that God can be trusted, then we need not to live in the fear that 
things might change tomorrow. As wrong as God is the one who has promised, he will deliver. So we need to get to the place of believing and having confidence in him. Jesus is the same yesterday and today. He shall be the same forever, even to eternity. Amen. That Jesus keeps his promises. And I want to ask at this point, is there anything that God has promised you and you're looking into your life? What is this that God has promised you? Did he promise? He is going to deliver. And you know when God promises, that's, that's when now things start happening and you start getting doubts about what God said to you, what he impressed upon your heart, what you knew this was from God and you were pursuing, and you start thinking, ah, I think, yeah, looking at uh, my age now, I think it's not going to happen. Or looking at my finances, things are not going to if he promised, he's going to deliver. Amen. Keep holding on. He's not a man. He's not, he's not even a parent. He's not that friend who promised. He's not even the government. <laughs> you know, there's a government that promises and never delivers. God is not that government. And you know, when, when people promise you things and they don't do, it affects you. It affects you. You get disappointed. You're like, ah, I had hopes. I had this and that. And it breaks us in our hearts, isn't it? But God is not like all those people, including that government. God promises and he will deliver. The number two thing we know about God is that God is love. The definition of love that we can get from the Bible, we can only get it from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 13, um, verse 4 to 8. And it talks about what love is. 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, um, verse 4 to 8. The definition of love in the Bible. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. And as we read this, please, we are trying to understand because this is God's character. We are looking at God. And all these things being said here, they define the love that we have received from God. We're saying God is love. And so if God is love, so love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Verse number five says, it does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, and you can read on and on and on. Now, if you're thinking about God, can you imagine for a moment if God wanted to show off, like, you know, the show off that we do, because we bought a new shoe, or we have a new dress, or we have a new car, or we have a new house. You know, when you have a new shoe, you sit like the way Sam is sitting. <laughs> if you have a new car, una pita magari zingine kwa barabara and asoma. Wow. <laughs> it's called show off. Can you imagine if God had that inferiority complex and he wanted to show off. We would be miserable, isn't it? But God is love. He doesn't do those things. First John chapter number 4, verse number 7 to 12 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love, does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God uh, was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. The truth is we have not seen God. <laughs> but when we love one another, then scripture comes true. We cannot... You see, there are people who saw God, the Moseses of that time, but we have not seen God. The only God we see, we see through the acts of brothers and sisters towards us. So that if the same, same people who are supposed to be exhibiting God are the ones who speak against us, they are ruled, they are, they are all those kind of things that we are saying love is not, then we miss to see God. Then we have not seen God. Then we do not belong to God. God is love. Let us love one another. That is God's character. That is God himself. Love. Jesus has loved us. He has loved the worst of us. The ones that have been ostracized in society. He has embraced even the fatherless. He has loved the worst of sinners, the wretched sinners, who you and I were before we got to know Christ. Jesus, as he walked this world, didn't mind his reputation. He didn't mind what people were going to say. That he is God, yet he is found with the tax collectors. That he is God, yet he is found with, with, um, with the prostitutes. That he is God, yet he is found with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He wanted to go to every person. Because he is love. The number three thing that we learn about God and his character is that God is righteous. One of the things that over time I have come to realize is that the kingdom of God, where we have come into, and the church is part of God's kingdom. The church is part of God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is bigger than what you think. That kingdom of God has two pillars. Whether it is before the church age, during the church age, after we are done with this life and we are looking at the judgment, there are two pillars that support the kingdom of God and stands on that. That is righteousness and justice. Two pillars that you and I need to be anchored on. Righteousness, that is being right with God, knowing that we are right with God. And justice, that you are not doing injustice to people. That you are not being found to be unjust. Not because of the position that you are in, or the blessings that you have received, or your status in society. If you are just, then you are acting in accordance to God's kingdom. And so God is righteous. He is the one who has given us his righteousness. Were it not for him, we wouldn't have been the way we are. And righteousness simply tells us uh, of, of the quality of being right in the eyes of God. And as we look at being right in the eyes of God, we're looking at the attitudes that we have. You could be right when we're looking at you, but we do not know the attitude that you carry. Now examine yourself. What attitude do you carry? What are your actions? What words do you use? Because words are not just used when there is somebody hearing. Even when you're speaking and nobody is hearing or listening to you, you speak words. You speak words. What kind of words do you release? Are those words having a right standing with God? What is the natural you? What is your nature? The, the person that is you. When you're examined, do you have the right standing with God? And God has provided for us to get to that place of that righteousness because it is given to us through Jesus Christ. On our own, we are not able to be righteous. The righteousness that we have has been given to us through Jesus Christ. 
So God is righteousness. And I have also said that God is together with righteousness because they go hand in hand. God is just. God will never oppress. God will never take that which is not his. Justice God has served justice. He has given us even the will to decide what we want to do. He's so just that he will not interfere with your life. God is so just, he will not be found oppressing you. Even when people are saying, yes, crucify him. God is just and he changes not. He will remain a just God. Is it possible for us as human beings living um, in the times that we are living in to just exercise, practice justice to people? People who maybe even we do not know. Others we know, but we are found to be unjust. I am, I'm, many times when, when, when I get into families, because I'm also coming from a place, and family members are fighting. And many times, family members fight over land. Thank you. So in, in Phoebe's family, they, they fight over land. <laughs> well, makes two of us, me and Phoebe. You guys don't fight, it's okay. When it lands in your house, that's when you will know that people fight over land. And the people that you thought should have stood for justice become the oppressors. Oh, the people who are left to take care of the orphans. Yeah? You are the brother to their father. You are the sister to their mother. And because you just got to know, you are at a point of advantage. You got to know when they were young that there was this and the other. and They, are, they actually say that you are the administrator. But you have taken advantage of those people. You are unjust in everything that you do. And you come to church and you want to tell God, <laughs> hey, are we going to heaven? There is no heaven for injustice. Justice, justice. Ju Let's practice it to the people who deserve, the people who don't deserve, because you and I never deserve justice. But God gave us a right standing. He cleared the penalty that was supposed to be paid by us. Said, I have made them just because of his love towards us. The other attribute of God is that God is holy. Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse number 1 to 3. And this is um, a scripture that is very, very well known to us. It says, in the, in, in the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord high and exalted uh, on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Verse number two. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, those creatures in heaven, 24-7, they cry out, they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That is who God is. God is holy. He is a glorious God. He has set himself above everything. Uh, he has set himself from sin. Because he is holy. Sin and God don't mix. Now, when we talk about sin, and we say sin is missing the mark, you know, that makes it sound very nice. Sin is missing the mark. So that you would say, if we were, if we were in a football match and I wanted to score and I missed it go ah sin. Now that is not the one we are talking about. We are talking about the sin that causes God to be separated from us. God is willing to work together with us, but every time we entertain sin, 
and none of us is without sin. If we say we have not sinned, then we make him a liar. The truth is that we have sinned. We have sinned, and the wages of sin is death. But the truth is that in his nature, God is holy, and we need to treat him as holy. And if he is holy, then we are being called to be holy. Sin is everything that is ugly. Everything that sets us against God. And we cannot overemphasize. Today, sin is all over. We, we, we have baptized it many things. But God, the God that we serve is holy. We are called to be holy. And the very last thing I want to say about God is about his mercy. His mercy, that God is a merciful God. And mercy here would be um, looking at God withholding the, the penalty we were supposed to receive the punishment that was due to us, in his mercy, in his nature of being a merciful God, he says, I've taken away the punishment. He has set the principles. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, they have sinned, they are supposed to pay for it. But then he comes in due to his merciful nature and says, I have taken away the punishment. They are no longer going to suffer that punishment. And if he has done that for us, what is it that we cannot give to him? Is it our lives? Is it the property that we have? Is it the desires and the dreams that we have? What is this that we cannot subject uh, under God? He is God of mercy. He is a merciful God. When the Lord appears to Moses on the mountain in the book of Exodus chapter number 34 and verse 67 we read in Exodus 34 67 and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth he appears to Moses that way he says he is a merciful God and God saying he's a merciful God, we can only receive him as a merciful God. Now, when God has extended his mercy to us, what then should our, our response be? Our response should be going to God and allowing him to have preeminence in our lives. Allowing him to be the one who is ruling, who is um, deciding what happens in that life in your daily engagements and activities. If that is the God that we serve, a merciful God, a holy God, a righteous God, God who is love, and God who can be trusted, what is it that we cannot give to him? And my prayer to us and for us this, this morning is that we will allow God to have his place in our lives. And as he comes in all those attributes, that we open our hearts, that where we feel challenged because we have served this God who is loving, this God who is trustworthy, this God who is just and holy, this God who is merciful, if we find any place in our hearts that is wanting, that we can go to him and surrender. Brothers and sisters, we will have no reason. We will have no excuse. When we appear before God, the one that we said is the creator of heaven and earth, and because we have come to the knowledge of the creator who created heaven and earth, he also created hell. Hell is God's hell. And it is a punishment for those that will say, we do not want your mercy. We are able to handle our lives. God will send people to hell. Actually, God will not send people to hell, people will send themselves to hell. And so my call to us, are you here 
and we have this God. He has come to us in diverse ways. He has expressed himself to us through the people we see, through the people we interact with, in his miraculous ways, in the universe that we live in and see. Would you want to give your life to him? And if you are here, you have not known that God. My prayer is that you will go to him. He is your father. He is concerned over every detail of your life. And he is able to handle what concerns you today. We need not be afraid. We believe in a God who can be trusted. We can entrust our lives to him. I want to pray. Are you here? You have not given your life to Jesus. We have presented this God. And that is the God that we serve. And that is the God that has called us. That is the God that is taking us to where we need to go. Would you want to give your life to him? Would you want to start a relationship with this God? The one who takes away the punishment that is due to you. The one who loves you unconditionally. The one who has created you. The one who knows your beginning from the end. And your end from the beginning. And even the in-between. And is concerned over every nitty-gritty um, about your life. As we bow in prayer, I want to ask, are you here? You want to give your life to Jesus? This could be the opportunity that was set for you to get to know this God, to interact with him, and to allow him to work in your life. If you're there, if you lift up your hand, we'll see it, and we'll pray together. Are you there? You want to give your life to Jesus. You want to commend yourself to the Lord who cares who knows you, who understands us, who, who is moved by what we go through. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we honor you this morning. We appreciate the fact that you have appeared to us, mighty and everlasting God, in your splendor. Yet you have also desired to live in our hearts and indeed you have made your abode in our hearts. What a mighty God you are. What a wonderful God you are. That you are so high lifted yet together with us in every day activity that we, we do and go through. In our everyday life, you are present. You are not just far removed. You know us. You are concerned over our lives. You have planned good for us. I want to thank you that our Father and our Lord that we can depend on you. That when we look to you, you will not leave us. You will not forsake us. You will not disappoint us. You are not like men who, who, who promises and they cannot deliver. You are a God who can be trusted. We want to thank you and honor you because we know, because we have entrusted our lives in you. We are a better people. We are in a better place. Our future is taken care of because you are sovereign. We thank you. We honor you this morning because we pray this trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen.